Hey everyone, welcome back to The Week in Charts. I'm your host, Charlie Bellello, and as always, we're going to run through the most important charts and themes in markets and investing. Huge show today. We're going to talk about the inflation report. We're going to talk about some of the issues with national debt and rising interest expenses. We're going to talk about who higher interest rates has been good for it, who has been bad for it, and much more. So let's start out with that inflation report and the fact that the streak is finally broken. We knew it was coming to an end, but here it is, 3.2% US CPI. That's up from 3% last month. We had seen a record 12 consecutive declines in that year-over-year inflation rate. It peaked in June 2022 at 9.1% and hit a low of 3% in June of this year. But this was expected. We talked about last week some of the reasons why inflation was likely to tick up. And the biggest driver of that is the fact that year-over-year commodity prices weren't going to show as big of a decline as they did in June. So looking into the report, it wasn't definitely not all bad news. The Again, that rise was expected was actually better than expected. The people thought that we were gonna get 3.3%, came in at 3.2%. And importantly, we had that core rate of inflation, core CPI actually continue to move lower, moving down to 4.7%. So that excludes food and energy and something obviously the Fed is looking at very closely and certainly still elevated, but there are some signs there that we're likely to see this trend of lower core prices continue. So. Digging into the report here, what do we have in terms of the breakdown? Well, we have most of the major components moving lower as compared to where they were in June 2022. So lower rates of inflation today. You have outright declines in fuel oil, gasoline, gas utility, used cars, medical care, and the other categories here showing lower rates of inflation than they did uh, back at the peak in U.S. inflation in June 2022. There are only two areas that are showing higher inflation rates today one being transportation and two this is the biggest component by far the shelter component that's still showing an elevated rate at 7.7 percent but certainly moving in the right direction this is now the fourth consecutive decline in that shelter cpi uh, from that peak of 8.2 percent now we're down to 7.7 percent and question is well, when is it going to start reflecting the actual housing data that we're seeing today, which is actually a decline in rents on a year-over-year basis? The answer to that is with a lag, and I think that trend has already started. We've talked about the reasons why shelter is a wildly lagging indicator, but here we are finally starting to reflect that deceleration in terms of housing inflation that we saw uh, throughout last year in terms of the actual data. So the months to come, we're gonna see this number likely to come down. How quickly it comes down is anyone's guess, but we're looking a year from now, we expect to see this number to be much lower. That's gonna drive uh, the core rate of inflation, it seems to be much lower. So this is a huge, huge factor in core inflation. And if we see this come down to a more uh, normal level, that's going to be a big uh, driver of that, I would think. So if we're looking at one of the huge positives in the report, number one I would point to is food at home. Uh, Continued sharp deceleration in terms of food inflation. So you're going to the grocery store, you probably noticed a lot of things are actually coming down in price from where they were a few uh, months ago and certainly not seeing that huge, unbelievable increases that we were seeing last year. So 13.5% was the peak in food price inflation in 2022. We're down 3.6% today. The number of components, if we're looking at the price of a dozen eggs, for example, are much lower than they were a few months ago. So I think we're looking at a 57% decline in a dozen eggs from 40 to a a dozen to 209 a dozen. Uh, That's great news. If you're uh, shopping in the supermarket every week, you could probably point to a number of items like this. I think this is the most glaring because people talked about it uh, so much uh, when prices were spiking in January. You're not getting the same types of reports today, but great news to see. And this is something uh, that's very important, obviously, for lower income people. They can't you're not, you're not going to change very much your spending. You could try to get discounts and sales, 
uh, but uh, lower food prices and lower food price in inflation is going to help uh, these people the most. So I think this is a great sign. Hopefully it continues. So let's talk about the road to prosperity. This is by, to me by far the most important chart in, in markets for the economy uh, in terms of prosperity of a nation. This is the first thing I would point to. You want to compare the real wages over time and you want to see real wages rising over time maybe not each and every quarter or each and every year uh, but certainly you want to see over a 10-year period wages outpaces pacing inflation and what we're seeing now is finally get a trend in the positive direction so for 25 consecutive months we saw wages not keeping up with inflation and that was a huge factor in 2022 led to a lot of negativity rightfully so people were not feeling good about that situation if you're going to the gas station going to the grocery store and you're facing a huge spike in prices and your income didn't go up as much well that's hitting you directly and now we're finally seeing the opposite situation where wages are up over 4% in the past year. And we have that 3.2% inflation rate. So we have a positive spread. People are feeling better about that. They should be. Hopefully that continues in the month to, months to come. Now, what could jeopardize this in the short run is I think uh, commodity prices moving back up. And we're starting to see some signs of that uh, continued. Uh, last week, seeing retail gas prices move up to 394 a gallon on average. Uh, so trending not in the best direction here year to date high we're seeing obviously crude oil prices moving higher as well and so that year over year tailwind that these lower commodity prices were providing for cpi is becoming much less of a tailwind and soon if they stay at these levels we're gonna, it's going to become a headwind because we're going to see gas prices higher than they were uh, a year ago so i think that's one of the reasons why if you look at the cleveland fed does this forecast of upcoming inflation one of the reasons why they're suggesting the overall rate of inflation is likely to increase again in august they're projecting 3.8 percent i think it's too early to say uh if it'll uh, come uh come up that high uh but certainly i don't think it would be uh, unreasonable to expect inflation to tick up again and the big driver of that's going to be commodities but if you look at that core cpi number they're actually saying that's going to come down again 4.46%. So I think the big driver of that, of course, is going to be that housing inflation number, which uh, the Cleveland Fed seems to be projecting. That's going to become uh, less less of a problem as we as we go out here, uh, looking at the August inflation data. So if we compare the U.S. to Europe, I would say that the U.S. is in a much better place in terms of its inflation rate versus Europe and it's where the central banks are currently. So we have that US inflation rate at 3.2%, Eurozone's at 5.3, Germany 6.2, UK's all the way up here at 7.9. And if we look at their central bank rates, well, in, Euro in Eurozone, if we look at the ECB or the Bank of England, both of their central bank rates still below the rates of inflation there. Whereas in the US, we have a central bank rate, Fed funds rate above 5%, and so we have a cushion there and the expectation is the fed is on pause for now but that the ecb and the bank of england still have work to be done so what exactly are those expectations for the market well as you know this changes all the time so take it with a grain of salt but as of now the market's expecting a pause at the next few meetings for the remainder of the year into early next year and then the market's saying the fed's going to start cutting rates in may of next year now will they cut rates in may of next year and start a cutting cycle who knows just a few months ago the market was saying that the fed was going to start cutting rates in september of this year so now we're all the way out into next year and that could very well shift again all of this is data dependent and markets dependent so if we see a big move down in the markets again this is going to change if the fed changes their rhetoric if we have inflation data that's higher than expected this is going to change or lower than expected this is going to change but for now this is what the market's expecting the fed's going to be on hold for at least the next few meetings so these rising interest rates, the Fed has hiked uh, over the past year over 500 basis points, moving from zero to over 5%. And what has this done to, let's say, the average American household? Has it been good? Has it been bad? 
I think it's really a tale of two cities and it depends on your personal situation. So I think to illustrate that, this chart really tells an important story where it's looking at the changes in interest payments and the changes in interest income over the last year. And you can see uh, we're paying 151 billion, this is the aggregate, more in interest payments. So that's due to rising uh, interest payments on debt, but we're, we're receiving 121 billion more in interest income. So if you have a savings account, you're, you likely noticed your income from that has gone up. Uh, and depending on your household situation, uh, this could be either good or bad or neutral, depending on uh, where you fall in terms of assets, liabilities, and are those liabilities uh, floating rate. So for the worst hit, these are, not, these are definitely not the best of times and probably the worst of times are for people who have significant credit card debt and they don't pay that balance off on a monthly basis because we're seeing an increasing level of this debt. So now we're over $1 trillion for the first time in terms of total US credit card debt. We're seeing an increased rate of increase here. So 16% increase over the last year, well higher than the rate of inflation. And we're seeing the highest credit card interest rates that we've seen in history, 20.7% on average. So you have higher debt levels, not paying it off every month. Well, now you're being hit with a higher interest rate on that. It becomes increasingly difficult to pay that off. Uh, and so the household balance sheet for people with credit card debt just becomes worse and worse the higher interest rates go. Now on the flip side, if you don't have any floating rate debt, you don't have any credit card debt or a variable rate mortgage or anything that's floating rate, uh, and you have a lot of assets, and particularly you have a lot of cash uh, yielding assets, well, now you're probably feeling the best you felt in over 20 years. We have the highest uh, three-month treasury bill yields since January 2001. So over 5.5% you can get by just buying three-month treasury bills. So that's likely a big uh, pickup in income for people they were yield starved for a long time. Only two years ago, remember, we were earning, looking at 0% on these three month treasury bills, and now you're at over 5.5%. So let's say you have a fixed rate mortgage of 3%, you have a lot of cash, you don't have any variable rate debt, you're probably feeling pretty good so far, at least, about uh, these 500 basis point plus in Fed increases. Who is it hitting, though, in terms of? the higher cost of debt, not just people uh, with credit card debt, but also people who are in the market for uh, new debt and really big purchases like housing or autos that we talked about last week are being hit uh, in terms of the demand side because you have prices have gone up significantly. So home prices in the US up over 40% in the past few years. And now you have uh, a much higher cost of financing that with mortgage rates at 7% versus uh, under 3% a few years ago. So the affordability factor is huge here. And this is certainly hurting any uh, new home buyers or if you're looking to finance that cost or buyers of, of cars or anything uh, that has a, a, a rate of interest that's impacted uh, by uh, increasing rates. So uh, it's really a tale of two cities. Uh, if you have existing debt that's fixed uh, and you have a high cash balance, probably feeling pretty good. Uh, if you don't, if you especially if you have variable rate debt, uh, you're probably feeling uh, not very good at all uh, from these interest rate increases. So there's, I think there's a tendency to say uh, that uh, uniformly these rate hikes have been bad, but it really depends on the specific situation of the individual or the household. So let's talk about the fiscal imbalance that's going on in terms of the federal government here. This is something that you shouldn't try at home, but the federal government is doing this uh, and continuing to do this on a consistent basis here where uh, they're actually spending 14% more over the last year in terms of government spending, but taking in 7% less in terms of tax revenue. And uh, if you or I did the, this, uh, we'd be in trouble very quickly. The federal government, it's just standard business. And that's because they could just increase the deficit and borrow more money. And that's exactly what they're doing. So we're seeing the 
federal budget deficit now widened once again in July to 2.26 uh, trillion. That's the highest we've seen in 18 months. And so we have higher debt levels, higher interest rates. So what is that doing to interest expense? Well, you can you might have guessed that continues to go up as well. It hit a record 857 billion over the last year in July. And so uh, what we're likely to see in the next few months, unfortunately, and perhaps even longer than that is a continued increase in this chart uh, approaching 1 trillion plus. And why is that the case? Well, what we're seeing is obviously higher debt. So higher debt, even with the same interest rate is gonna lead to higher uh, interest expense, but also we're having a lot of the old debt mature and it's being uh, renewed, reissued uh, uh, at much higher interest rates. So the cost of the overall cost of the US debt is increasing each and every month. If we look at the percentage of uh, outstanding treasuries that are five years or less in duration, it's 75% of the market and over 40% is one year or less. So back in 2020, when we were talking about record low interest rates and we were saying, why isn't the government shifting their balance sheet and issuing super long-term debt, 30, 30 year debt, uh, should have been the majority of the case. You had interest rates on 30 year treasuries below 1%. Well, they didn't do that. They didn't take advantage of that. Perhaps they didn't think, uh, see this coming for whatever reason, but here we are. Uh, and, uh, is it too late to refinance this? Well, yeah, it seems to be, unless you think interest rates are going, uh, going to be 10%, uh, perhaps then it's not too late, but point being here is a lot of this debt is continuing to roll, especially the short term at higher yields. And then particularly if you're looking at, let's say, you know, a five year bond or 10 year bond, uh, that was issued five years ago. Well, now you have a huge, huge increase in terms of what that's going to cost the government. So if we look at some of the projections, uh, it's not a pretty picture here. This is a, a congressional budget office forecast is looking for significant increase in terms of that interest expense over the next few years. And they're projecting an average interest rate on that debt of 3%. If we look at three and a half percent or 4% or even higher than that, you can see how quickly uh, the math accelerates. So we don't, it's going to, it's impossible to predict what that interest expense is going to be going forward. But in the short term, uh, it's pretty likely. And of course, unless the fed starts cutting rates, we're going to see higher uh, interest expense. And the reason why this is problematic, as we've talked about, is that when the interest expense becomes a bigger and bigger part of the budget, it's going to likely either crowd out other areas of spending. So things that are necessary or more important, obviously, than covering interest. Well, now you're going to have a choice to make, or you're just going to have to borrow even more money to account for that. And in the short run, that's what we're doing. We're simply borrowing more money to pay for that interest uh, increase in interest expense. But over the long run, at a certain point, it becomes uh, problematic. We're not at that point today. Uh, no one seems to be in the federal government seems to be uh, making this an important issue. Uh, and my view is that it's going to continue until it becomes a real problem because that's just the way Washington operates. They wait until something becomes a crisis uh, before they start to do anything about it. And of course, no one on their watch wants to be the one to deal with this because uh, it's going to cause a hit to economic growth. So that huge deficit chart that we just showed uh, is actually stimulating the economy because we're not paying for it. We're borrowing money and putting it into the economy, building factories uh, and doing other 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 programs. Uh, and we're doing it not with money uh, that we're getting from revenues, but money that we're simply borrowing and going to uh, pay back or promise to pay back at a later date. So no appetite today. I suspect as this continues and becomes more of an issue, then you'll have people start to talk about, uh, hopefully at that point, it won't be too late uh, to, to make these structural changes. I think obviously you should start talking about and thinking about it today. So let's talk about something that wasn't supposed to happen. So if you listen to market uh, pundits and analysts, what they'll always tell you is that rising interest rates are going to lead to lower valuations. And they seem to suggest that it's a one-for-one -one relationship 
10 year bond goes from uh, 2% to 3% or 2% to 4%. And you're going to see the multiple contract and they never, uh, they never say, uh, well, it might contract it. They say, well, it's a definitive that it's a one for one relationship, higher interest rates, lower multiples. Well, I've written a lot about it. I've tested and studied the data. The relationship is not nearly as strong as people would suggest. It's a, it's a factor to be sure, but a very minor factor compared to market sentiment. So if we look at uh, Apple here as a case study, I think it tells the story. Well, first of all, we have 10 years ago, we had a 10 year treasury yield at 2.7% and Fed funds rate was at zero. And today we have a 10 year above 4% and Fed funds rate above 5%. So you would probably say, well, Apple should have a lower multiple today than 10 years ago. Is that actually the case? No, you could see from this chart, it has actually, its PE ratio went from 12X 10 years ago to 30X today. It's price to sales ratio went from two and a half times sales a decade ago to seven and a half times sales today. So what went wrong here? Why doesn't this equation uh, work out? It's because sentiment drives everything in the short run. So this idea, this theoretical model that the, uh, because the cost of capital has gone up, people are going to pay a lower multiple. Yes, maybe in theory, but in practice, investors today are much more excited about the prospect future prospects of Apple today than a decade ago. And the fact that interest rates are, are higher than they were a decade ago, they're not thinking about that. At least they're not thinking about it today. So be very careful in markets and investing with anyone who tells you there's any type of simple rule uh, that's going to dictate uh, what prices or multiples do, because you cannot predict the most important factor when it comes to stocks, which is sentiment. Now, I guess the bigger question today is that sentiment overly exuberant and it's hard to argue uh that it's at least not on the higher side in terms of historical here if we look at the even the 10-year average of the p ratio or ev ebitda or price to sales you can see well above the average in all of these cases and as we talked about apple interestingly actually had declining year-over-year -year sales for three consecutive quarters so it's not like they're posting enormous growth they of course had a, a big surge in growth from the stimulus payments if you look at their 2021 numbers just enormous so they had a step wise move higher apple obviously a great company but it's hard to argue that apple's cheap today very different than where it was a decade ago and just remember sentiment is going to drive everything from from where it goes going forward and interest rates may be a factor in that but it's just one of many factors when it comes to determining a company's multiple or even the market's multiple as a whole because if you look at the s p 500 you would see something similar higher p ratio today than a decade ago a higher price to sales ratio than a decade ago interesting piece from the wall street journal talking about the shift in trade so looking at the U.S. and their trading partners, and for a long time, China was the biggest uh, player in terms of U.S. trade, uh, but we've seen uh, the numbers uh, really starting to decline here. 13.3% of U.S. goods were imported from China during the first six months of this year. That was the smallest percentage that we've seen in 20 years. And if we look at the, uh, if we look at the percent where some of that is going, well, we're seeing numbers increase this year for Europe and the UK. We're seeing over the past five years, Asia excluding China. So areas like Taiwan, Thailand, Vietnam, South Korea, that going up. We're also seeing Mexico increase as well. And now we're at the point where if we look at you know, total trade with the US, so total percentage of trade, so imports, exports combined, we have Mexico now the number one trading partner with the U.S., Canada close uh, number two, and China falling down to number three in terms of trade uh, with the U.S. So a big shift, China for a number of years here. If we look at 2015 to uh, 2019 or 2018, and then again in 2020, China was a leading uh, trading partner with the U.S., now uh, much lower at 13%, and it seems to be a trend uh, that may continue here. So looking at semiconductors, this has been big in the news. 
uh, in terms of uh, the U.S. not wanting to import as much in terms of semiconductor or be reliant on China. And you can see uh, the declining share of semiconductor uh, uh, imports from China and increases to Vietnam, increases to Thailand, increases to India. And if we look at smartphones, still very high. I think 75% was the number in terms of the percentage of U.S. smartphone phone imports from China and Apple, of course, the big driver of that. Uh, but that too is lower than where it was a few years ago it was over 80%. And I think there was a big news story about Apple, uh, Foxconn, uh, the Apple iPhone uh, supplier uh, opening up uh, huge factories in India. So you're seeing that share from India uh, increasing uh, this year by a pretty good amount. And if we look at things like apparel uh, and uh, we're seeing uh, just uh, China decreasing while Asia X China increasing over the past few years. Um, and part of that is the trade relations. Other part is simply the cost of labor and, and the focus on labor in China in terms of labor practices. Uh, so companies not uh, wanting to do as much business with China. Uh, and the cost of labor in China has gone up where it's not as competitive as these other uh, Southeast Asian countries. Uh, and if we look at uh, if we look at where what this is doing, perhaps the Chinese economy, well, the, the recent data is it doesn't seem to be very good. They're actually reporting and it's very hard to trust the data out of China. So who knows if this is true or not, but they're actually reporting negative inflation rates uh, in China. Uh, so that if that's ac accurate, that's a sign uh, that the economy is likely uh, slowing down. You obviously have demographic issues there in China uh, in terms of their population growth is, uh, is much lower than it was. Uh, and you have just the issue, the overhang uh, that we had uh, from COVID and it doesn't seem to be recovered in terms of international travel there uh, and a lot of other drivers of the Chinese economy. So we'll see how this plays out in terms of how it affects, let's say US inflation. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, people that often say that China is either exporting inflation or deflation to the world. So is this gonna have an impact on US prices uh, going forward? Perhaps uh, uh, inflation is gonna continue to moderate in the US in part because of a slowdown in China. And just how is this gonna impact uh, the global economy if China indeed is falling into a recession? Now, remember, uh, China is, is different than most of the, uh, the economies and central banks because they have started an easing cycle. So uh, perhaps that's a reflection. They're already uh, starting the, the stimulus. And so for, perhaps with a lag, uh, that's going to lead to an increase in, in, in China's growth rate, but something to watch for sure, given how big China is in terms of uh, its share uh, of the uh, global economic output. So Let's talk about refilling uh, the reserves. Uh, and uh, this was a trend that we talked about all of last year, this year as well. We were drawing down the strategic petroleum reserve and the idea, and to me it was all optics because it's, it's just so little in terms of what our actual consumption is that it really doesn't make a difference, but it's an interesting thing to talk about. Uh, but we were depleting that strategic petroleum res reserves at the fastest pace in history. So over the past couple of years, there was a 270 uh, million barrel uh, decrease in the strategic petroleum reserve. And it was pretty constant, uh, just one direction down. Well, last week, we actually saw it move up for the first time in a long time. It was the biggest increase since June 2020. So the question is, are we going to start to refill this? And if we are, if we do it at this pace, it's going to take forever to replenish it. And I guess the other question would be, why did we wait for crude oil to go back up to $80 plus a barrel? Why don't we start buying it when it was much cheaper a few months ago? Well, all of that who knows, but uh, interesting to see that this has stopped, at least in term, at least for now, in terms of, of going down. And perhaps that's a reflection that optically uh, they, they're, they're viewing as the current price of gasoline to be acceptable. 
and perhaps uh, they want to start refilling this to, so they have room to withdraw in the future. Who knows? To me, it's 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 such a small amount that it's almost irrelevant, but it, it gets a lot of uh, attention in terms of people talking about it. So I thought I'd mention that uh, it's not only stopped going down, but is actually starting to move uh, in the other direction. New housing high, this is something I certainly didn't expect. There was no reason to believe a year ago, given the rate of increase in mortgages that we're going to see a total value of residential real estate higher today than it was a, a year ago. Had that move lower, it seemed like the start of a more sustained move lower and prices are only a little bit higher than a year ago in aggregate. But Redfin is now saying that U.S. residential real estate, the total value hit a record 46.8 trillion in June, 2023, surpassing the prior all-time high of 46.6 in June, 2022. So just incredible comeback. Uh, it wasn't a big decline, but a comeback here in terms of prices of housing. And we talked about the reason for that. It's all about supply. So demand has absolutely collapsed and that's because they, people can't afford uh, these houses at their current prices and the current mortgage rates. Uh, but supply has come down even more because people aren't selling their homes who are locked into uh, low mortgage rates. They don't want to give up those rates. So for now, uh, not to say that we're going to see a surge higher in housing prices, but just fascinating to see uh, that the resiliency of the housing market and what seemed to be uh, a sure sign that we're going to see lower prices just because affordability uh, was so uh, ridiculously low. But that's where we are today. It's the affordability picture hasn't changed. It's not going to change unless prices fall or mortgage rates fall. But for now, we have a standstill, but at a high level. And of course, this is a boost in terms of, of economic activity. We're having more housing construction, unexpected boost uh, because new uh, homes are being built uh, because of that deficit of existing homes. Uh, and you have, of course, people feeling better about their situation if they're seeing their home prices uh, higher in value. So in the short run for now, uh, this is, it will be a positive sign for the economy. I want to end here as I do always with a positive uh, news. And if I want to talk about positive news in general, because it's very rare uh, that you see it in the actual news. Uh, I don't I don't listen to the news or read much of the daily news because it's bombarded with uh, negativity. It's bombarded with things that are going in the wrong direction because that's what get, it gets attention. It's absolutely, uh, 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 it's absolutely bad for your health to be looking at this because it's only one thing that they're talking about. And it's often uh, these uh, tragic events that you can't do anything about. And if you look at uh, uh, human history, well, there's been so much tremendous progress that we've seen over the past few centuries, but that doesn't get any attention at all because it's incremental progress. It's very small. It's just a small amount every day, every week, every month uh, that the human condition has gotten better. And just one example of that, because we're talking so much about inflation in the past few years, just some perspective in terms of how much better of a situation we are in terms of inflation than we were back in history. This is a study that looked at uh, in England, uh, how many hours it takes uh, to uh, to make enough money to buy a pound of beef or mutton. I don't know <laughs> mutton used to be popular, but not so much anymore, or a pound of, of pork. And you can see uh, back in 1636, it took over three hours uh, to earn enough to buy a pound of beef in 1860. Uh, less 2.38 uh, hours. And where we are in 2022, uh, it took uh, less than a third of an hour. So you're talking about less than 20 minutes to earn enough to buy a pound of beef. And this, when we talk about prosperity, this is uh, just one of many charts that illustrate the same thing, which is that we're in a much better situation today than we were 50 years ago, 100 years ago. But as compared to a few hundred years ago, there's no comparison. And uh, all of that prosperity has come through innovation, has come through free markets, has come from the fact that we continue to see uh, increasing levels of prosperity where those real wages, if I showed a chart of that real wages over time, 
you're seeing up and to the right over long periods of time. So the lesson from this, I think is pretty clear. Try as much as possible to ignore or uh, the short-term negativity and try to look for bigger, positive, long-term trends. And this is a great one, obviously, to see. And hopefully, uh, this will continue, not just in terms of food, but in terms of energy and everything else. You want that to become a much lower percentage of a household's budget. And they, then they have money to save and invest. Uh, and, and obviously more free time to do, uh, to pursue other things. And all that has gotten better over the past hundred years. And absolutely, uh, no one on the, on the nightly news is talking about anything positive like this. So with that, we'll end it right there. Have a great week, everyone. If you like the content as always subscribe to the channel for more content, just like this, and I'll see you next time on the week in charts.